And welcome to Mayflower Congregational Church, United Church of Christ, where we believe that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Let's be in prayer together. Gracious God, we know that Lent is a time of patient waiting. And many of us have been waiting, that is, but with maybe not so much patience. We've been waiting for the Mueller report. And we haven't seen the report itself, but we read about the four page summary and if we haven't read the summary, we certainly heard the eight-word synopsis. No collusion, no obstruction, total exoneration, total vindication. Somehow we are, we are still waiting, Lord. Now we understand that the full report with redactions will be public next month, maybe by Easter Sunday, maybe. And we are like the women outside the tomb, wondering who will roll away that stone. Forgive us, Lord, because if ever there was a lesson of Lent, here it is before us. The kingdom of God is not only yet to come, it is already here. Forgive us, Lord, for looking for a Messiah when the title is already taken. We ask for courage, Lord, and patience. The courage to discern the truth and act upon it. The patience to wait in hope as your kingdom breaks in upon us, confounding all our expectations. We pray in the memory of Jesus Christ, whose ministry declared your kingdom. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough to spare? And, but here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be, to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while, while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and, and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him, but he answered his father, listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you and I have never disobeyed obeyed your command, yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might, I might celebrate with my friends. But, when, a son of, but this, when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the, fat, the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. 
but we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. Here ends the reading of these words from our tradition. May God grant us wisdom and courage for interpretation. I want to do this one more time, just one more time. <laughs> I'll, I'll keep doing it, but there won't be anything there. Um, there was a man who had two sons. That's not a very compelling way to begin the world's most famous parable, is it? But then again, I must tell you that it hits home for me being a man with two sons. An older, that would be blue, and a younger, that would be Cass, and the younger of them, that would be Cass, said to his father, that would be me, drop dead. <laughs> drop dead. That, that's exactly what the parable really says the younger son said to his father, which I'll explain in a moment. But if I wanted to make this sound more contemporary, I'd have my younger son put it this way. Hey, pops, have I told you lately that I love you? You are the best dad. So while we're having this meaningful moment, can I please have my inheritance early? Because I just turned 21, I've got this new Camaro, and a road trip is calling me. You know what you always said, Dad, and in your sermons too, about how a person has to go away before they can come home? Well, I need some help to go away. <laughs> Our problem with this parable and all the familiar material in the New Testament is that we think we know what it means before we actually listen to it. Today we hear the request by the young son as sort of harmless, as a kind of you know, parental advance on the younger son's plans to go wild and then come to his senses and then come home and be forgiven and welcomed. But in those days, when a child came to ask for his inheritance early, it was viewed as the ultimate act of disrespect. In fact, the ancients would have heard this request as a kind of attack upon the father, a violation of the commandment to honor one's father. Why? Because according to the wisdom teachings concerning inheritance in those days, it was considered a strain on a father's honor if the father ended up being dependent on his children. So in that that apocryphal collection of wisdom teachings called Ecclesiasticus, or the wisdom of Sirach, there is advice given on this whole matter of inheritance. And so the first hearers of the parable would have known it, and thus they would have found the request of the younger son to be offensive. Quote, while you have breath in you, says Ben Sirach, or Sirach, don't do it. In the hour of your death, distribute your inheritance and not before. Otherwise, you see, the parent-child the parent role could be reversed, and you might one day have to beg from your own son to live. What's more, in those days, the eldest son was already set to receive two-thirds of the property on the death of his father, and the younger son and any other sons could divide the remaining one-third among themselves. The girls got nothing, of course, because they were girls. Now, that would not work with my daughter, but I digress. In the ancient world, the point was to protect the family, not the individual. This allowed the elder son to buy out the younger son or sons and maintain the family possessions. It was a patriarchy. And a single male must end up with all the money and power. That's how patriarchy works. So to be a younger son was to be condemned to poverty or near poverty, but he was never to ask for money early, for as a rabbinic proverb declares, God will not answer the prayers of those who transfer his property to his children in his lifetime. Woo! So that's what I mean when I say the younger son really said to his father, drop dead. And then it goes downhill from there. But first, a word about this parable and its place in the canon of Western literature. Perhaps only the parable of the Good Samaritan is more famous or well known. This is the longest parable in the Bible and it appears only in Luke's gospel and maybe entirely Luke's creation. 
but he places it in a section in which he is stressing things that are lost and then found. Lost sheep, lost coin, now lost son. Jesus has been getting a lot of criticism for hanging out with sinners, and Luke wants to stress that in heaven there's more rejoicing over one saved sinner than over 99 virtuous people who did not have any need. Would Israel reject Jesus as they had rejected their own prophets in the past? Many scholars equate the older brother in the parable with Israel, who is resentful over what seems like the cheap grace of the gospel extended to the prodigal. But in fact, the parable itself does not indicate that accepting the vision of Jesus involves a rejection of God's chosen people. Remember what the father says to his elder son? Everything that's mine is yours. So the offense of this parable lies deeper and we need to go deeper to find it. First of all, this is a parable of sibling rivalry. And that theme runs through the Bible from start to finish and continues as a literary staple to this day. In the 1984 movie Amadeus, the storyline is about the intrigue and hatred between the older, less talented brother and the younger, more profligate Mozart. In the beautiful film, a river runs through it. There's a hardworking elder brother and the wastrel young son who is the apple of his father and mother's eye. These stories move us, quite frankly, because they are true. This is the way life is. Family life is complicated and sometimes enormously painful. Sibling rivalry and the perception that certain children were mom or dad's favorite have kept therapists in business forever. <laughs> Often parents deal with different children differently because they know how different their children are. And often that means more attention to the struggling child, which is then viewed by the strong child as neglect. Mom or dad always liked you best, and so on. Sibling rivalry, powerful, real, complicated, often the stuff of Greek tragedy. And as I've said countless times in this pulpit, all families are dysfunctional. That would be the gospel truth. Some more than others, but all are dysfunctional. And in the case of this parable, we should make no assumptions about this being some kind of nuclear biological family like leave it to beaver. It could be that the two sons are not even from the same mother and that the father and the elder son may be closer in age than is the elder and younger son. Some people have been bothered by the fact that we don't ever get to meet the prodigal's mother or any of his sisters, but that's not the way parables work. They're like the old Rolling Stones song, you can't always get what you want, but you do get what you need. That's it. No names, addresses, phone numbers, parables are about anonymous people. They're always past tense. They invite the listener to enter into the experience of hearing a story, since this is an oral, not a literate culture. And so they just begin, there was a man who had two sons. No baggage that comes with naming the father, naming the sons, the town they lived in, the name of their mother, what anyone does for a living, their hobbies, Facebook stuff. No, none of that. We're dealing with archetypes, and then listeners get to fill in the blanks because a parable is meant to trap you in an experience of the truth and not the one you were expecting. What we do know is that this family is wealthy. They have enough land to send the younger son off on this adventure and still run the farm with slaves and hired hands, and they have a fatted calf. They have a fatted calf. So in every way, the father has made it in those days. He has two sons to carry on the family name, and he is rich. And he really owns these boys because that's how it was in those days. The power of the father was enormous to give and receive in marriage, to discipline, sometimes without mercy. I mean, think of the movie The Godfather, and you're close. Then imagine such a patriarch actually giving his younger son an early inheritance without even asking him how he planned to spend the money. Or making it clear, as my father would have done, that it's a loan. This is a loan. It must be paid back with interest. Uh, or maybe we should call the whole family in here to sort of own this decision together, have a little family conference. 
explain that Junior's going on a trip, needs some money. Let's all try to understand this need he has to take off and embarrass us all. <laughs> He'll come to his senses, but in the meantime, we should pull together as a family. And then the younger son smiles and says, I love you all so much. Goodbye. And then to make matters worse, he doesn't just squander the money on bad investments. He throws it away. He squanders it in dissolute, as the New Revised Standard Version. My favorite is loose living, loose living. Because preachers love to expound when I was a kid on the exact meaning of loose living. <laughs> we all know what it was. The Greek word is asotos, which has a hint of sexual excess. Or as my grandmother would say, he goes whoring with his father's money. <laughs> you should have met my grandmother. <laughs> and this is not like Las Vegas, where what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. No, these are small towns, people talk. So just think how it makes the father look to have financed his own son's decadence. A famine arises and party boy must go to work feeding pigs for a Gentile, the lowest possible occupation for a Jew, working for a foreigner, tending an unclean animal. He's literally wallowing in a pigsty, still smelling of cheap perfume. He, he comes uh, to one of these moments internally in the Bible where his inner state is revealed. And this is very rare. The text says he came to himself. I'll bet he did. And this doesn't mean he repented, as Christians understand the term, but merely that he came to his senses. We can't even assume anything more noble on his part than just a plan to survive and try to get back into the family he's disgraced. I mean, he's a kid who seems to be able to talk himself into or out of anything, so let's not assume that the pigsty is really a Damascus Road experience. It may be just his way of tricking his father again, thinking to himself, I'll just crawl home and ask to be one of the hired hands, knowing perfectly well his father would never make him one of the hired hands. And now the parable turns in the most unexpected, even unbelievable way possible. Because every parable has a reversal, an unexpected moment when the listener is blindsided by something that doesn't fit or is even shocking. And in this parable, it's the behavior of the father, the one who's been shamed. That's the reversal. When he sees his son while he is, quote, still a long way off, we must assume that that's because he's been watching for him. This old man, part of his fortune wasted, his reputation in shambles, must in fact have been sitting near a window where he can watch for the return of the son who has disgraced him. And then comes this luminous line, simple, poignant, and Luke, I think, believes constitutes the heart of the gospel. And if you don't feel a chill go up your spine when you hear this, get your spine, tiller, your spine tingler checked. He, he, he sees him, is moved with compassion, and get this, runs to meet him. He runs this old man on brittle bones, which means he would have had to hike up his robe so his old legs would show, itself kind of disgraceful. And he runs to meet the son who smells like pigs, the one who's already practicing his little woe is me speech, but doesn't even get to finish it. Father, I've sinned, he begins, only to have the father cut him off, because he's too full of joy to hear a confession right now. Bring the robe the ring, sandals for his feet, kill the fatted calf. My dead son is alive, my lost son is found. Notice, no probationary period. No lecture that begins, <clears throat> do you know how disappointed your mother and I have been? No cold stares. No, oh, look what the cat dragged in. No, no put on your work clothes, they haven't been getting much use, and get out there and help your brother, and one of these days when I calm down, we can talk. But right now, get out of my sight. No. At the sight of him, he runs, throws his arms around the prodigal, and hold everything, 
fell on his neck and kissed him. That's how the Greek puts it. It even indicates a kind of intensification as in kissed him over and over. The closest thing we have to this language is the story of the woman who anoints Jesus' feet with costly perfume, wipes them with her hair, and kisses them. And when Peter complains about her unsightly behavior, Jesus responds, you didn't offer me a kiss, but she has not stopped, she has not stopped kissing my feet since I arrived. So this is not just a kiss of greeting by the Father. This requires that we imagine that the father is behaving more like a woman or a father who acts like a mother. Now you know this is only part one of a two-part parable. This is really the parable of the prodigals, plural, because the elder brother is out in the field and just imagine that you're him. He hears music and dancing wafting over and he arrives back at the house and he sees servants stumbling around the yard wearing those party hats and blowing on those noisemakers and chewing on drumsticks and he thinks to himself well isn't this special a party as he wipes the mud off his hands from working his father's land his little brother covered with the mud of pigs and carrying who knows what sexually transmitted disease is having a party. And there on the spit above the fire is the fatted calf going round and round and round, the fatted calf that nobody ever gave to me. So he prepares a little speech about how hard he's always worked, how little he has to show for it, and then he stands outside the party refusing to go in. And the parable ends with him still standing outside. We don't know if he ever goes in. But the father who acts like a mother summed it all up. Son, you're always with me and all that's mine is yours. But we had to celebrate because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. And this may be the oldest story in the world. Sibling rivalry versus amazing grace. So sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. If you want grace to make sense, you're out of luck. John Wesley said, nothing is more offensive to the average person than the grace of God. And the great Presbyterian preacher Ernest Campbell summed up this parable this way, what we have today is a loving father gospel in an elder brother church. Do this for me. Think of your own father, whether he's alive or dead, and just imagine what it would be like in this world if more strict fathers could be like loving mothers. Fathers, they sometimes try so hard to be fair to all their children, to treat them all the same, to be the strict disciplinarian, that they never find a way to give each child what that child needs. Have you ever been in a room where one child gets a gift and the others do not? That doesn't go well. We're no different when we become adults. We're resentful of the good fortune of others, usually because we think they don't deserve it. Our calculations when it comes to grace always fall short. We're not God, and our thoughts are not God's thoughts even on our best days. Think about it. As this remarkable story ends, there's a prodigal inside the house having a party who seems to have gotten away with it and yet is restored, and standing outside is an elder brother who really has all the property and all the power and whose father never had to worry about whether he would ever come home and he is the one who is angry. Think of how often, when we have everything, we want just a little bit more. When we are privileged, it's never quite privileged enough. When we are strong, we assume we're being justly rewarded, but the weak, they must deserve their status. But the father in this parable does not discriminate. Just as he ran to meet the prodigal son, he leaves the party and goes out to meet the elder son. This is like the traveling father, the opposite of the king who sits on a throne and has his subjects come to him. Bring my subjects to me. The father goes out of the party and addresses his own firstborn son tenderly as my dear child. 
In most stories, there's a protagonist and an antagonist, and we expect the righteousness of one character to be purchased at the expense of the other. So, in this part of the parable, we expect that the younger son will play the role of protagonist and the elder the antagonist. But again, the father will not choose between them. In fact, both sons are really the antagonists in this story, and the father is the protagonist. He will not be forced to choose between them because love is not a zero-sum game. He cares nothing for his honor. He cares only for his sons. Think about it. He cares nothing for his honor. He cares only for his sons. Try as they might, they cannot escape from that love. The parable closes without a third act. Without any resolution, the audience is left to wonder what will become of these boys. The father will die, and then what? Will they play their respective roles out and collide over their inheritance again? Will one kill the other to set things right and protect their male honor? Or will they remember their father who loved like a mother and follow in his footsteps and someday run out to meet their own sons and daughters and refuse to choose between them? We all have a choice between being lost or found, dead or alive. We can accept the gift or we can keep on trying to figure out who really deserves the gift. The beloved hymn we are about to sing does not say quid pro quo how sweet the sound that paid me all I owe. I'm never lost but my own boss can see just fine, thank you very much. Rewrite these hymns sometimes, make them the opposite, it's kind of fun. It says, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. If you're able, let's sing it together and see if our spine chiller is working.